prior to, to coming to UVM as our president, uh, Dan Fogel was the executive vice chancellor and provost at Louisiana State University, a land grant and sea grant institution, a much bigger university than uh, UVM, but clearly doesn't have as good of sports teams as we do here. <laughs> Uh, in addition to being provost there, Dan was dean of the Graduate College, a chair for a period of time in the Department of English, and a, has a comprehensive understanding of how universities function and at times don't function. Dan is, was born and raised in Ithaca, New York, received his bachelor's degree in English from Cornell, and then his graduate degrees also uh, in English and creative writing and poetry. He's a scholar. He's a teacher, and he's the president of the University of Vermont. So please join me in welcoming President Dan Fogel. Thank you. Well, that, that was an exceedingly generous introduction, Don. You know, I feel so inadequate talking to a, an audience like this one, experts on the environment, people from whom I've been learning ever since I got here. Uh, about environmental concerns and sustainability. Dean DeHayes, John Todd, Julia, I know Bob Costanza is going to be watching this on video. Uh, and what am I? The scholar of Henry James, a, a poet, at least mostly a poet of, of uh, landscape and inner territory. Uh, who sat at the knee of A.R. Evans, and if you know his poetry, I think you will know that he is one of the most uh, engaged with the ecology of, of the world around us, of any of the major modern poets. Uh, but it is humbling, and, and Don's introduction is suspect, uh, because he has a stake in making me look good because he was on the search committee that brought me here. <laughs> but uh, I do thank you, Don, very much. Uh, but now, the title of this talk, uh, like any other wisdom that I have to offer you, will derive from other people. And in this case, the title came from Bob Costanza. He suggested that I talk about the university in a sustainable and desirable future. I, I will do that. Uh, but I'm going to try to leave something like half our time uh, for you to ask questions and engage us in discussion. And I hope that you will be more aggressive than our wonderful colleagues in the Faculty Senate, who always disappoint me when I say, come on, ask me anything. And they don't. They're so quiet and respectful. You know, it's sort of like, come on, take a punch, and no one does. So you can do that. You can ask me anything. This will be fun, and we will uh, uh, we will try to limit my remarks, which are less informed than anything you will have to say. Well, let's start with, with Bob's title, which is now my title, and, and talk about what we mean by a sustainable and desirable future. And I think we can, we can sum that up fairly quickly. Uh, we all know what we mean by sustainable, I think. Uh, we, we mean that uh, the economy, whether it's human or social or political, whether it looks at resources, whether it looks at the natural world, has to renew the resources on which it draws and has to do in a way that maintains their quality and their diversity and uh, their service both in and of themselves and of course to human happiness and human well-being as well as to the well-being and the sustainability of the natural world around us. I think that probably sums up what we mean by desirable as well. Uh, but it's important to say that we're looking for a sustainable and desirable future because it would be possible to have systems that are sustainable that are evil. In fact, we've seen a lot of systems and tyrannies over the course of human history that sustained themselves for millennia and that were clearly not at all decided. Uh, beyond that, I think, you know, when we talk about us, the university in a sustainable and desirable future, we 
we want to think of something that is highly integrated across all of the realms of thought and discourse that concern us, uh, that it be sustainable and desirable uh, for, our, for our, the social world in which we all live and interact with each other, uh, for the political world, certainly for our academic mission and teaching and research and service, uh, that it be integrated across those domains, but of course also across the domain of the, of the natural world around us, uh, and so on. Uh, and finally, I, I think when we say that it should be integrated, we really mean that it should not uh, pit uh, potentially competing goods against each other. And one of the things that has really struck me as I've been uh, barnstorming the state for the last year talking about economic development in the state of Vermont is how much uh, the business community in particular in the state has been polarized around the issue of the environment. And I, I was really a little bit naive when I started out talking about uh, finding a niche for Vermont in the national and global economies where we would be positioned as the global leader in environmental enterprises. I really didn't fully appreciate how many people in my Chamber of Commerce audiences would even bristle at the word environmental, seeing uh, environmentalism in our state as inimical to uh, making money, running a business, getting things done. Uh, I should have known, uh, because I've actually sat in meetings with people who have made this abundantly clear to me. Uh, I'll give you one anecdote, which uh, I think will give you a sense of why people are this way, because I think it's, it's hard for us to understand sometimes quite why they're this way, but uh, when we're living in our, our world, which is very different from the world of, of, of some of the people who see this polarization so sharply. I, I was in a meeting one day with uh, the CEO of April Cornell, Chris Cornell. And Chris came in with a binder this thick, literally that thick. I've never seen such a big binder. And he said, these are the forms I had to file over an 18-month period at a cost of more than $150,000 to try to build a distribution center in Milton, Vermont. Six weeks later, he announced that they weren't going to do it in Vermont. They were going to take it to New York. Uh, and he talked to us about why that was uh, when he brought in that binder. He hadn't made the decision yet, or he said he hadn't. Uh, but what was it? I mean, in Plattsburgh, in their enterprise zone, they told him they would walk all that paperwork through in 30 days. And of course, electricity was going to cost him three and a half cents a kilowatt hour there, as compared to 11 cents a kilowatt hour here. You know, that's a terrible challenge for us uh, in terms of building it any sense that you can create something new in terms of economic activity in the state of Vermont. That, it, that uh, it's just hard to get things done and then it's expensive. Uh, we had a wonderful grant here. It was a joint grant for, between UVM and Cornell uh, for the Northeast Center for Food Entrepreneurship. And I went one day with uh, Kathy Donnelly to visit one of the firms that had been started with, uh, in part through that grant activity, uh, a firm called Home Bistro. Anyone bought anything from Home Bistro? Me neither. They gave me some samples and I couldn't quite ever, I left them in the freezer for a long time and finally threw them out, but they were, <laughs> but I'd been in the factory, I mean, geez, it was, you know, but they made these gourmet meals, they were sort of, for yuppies who were too busy to cook. Uh, so they made these great gourmet meals and they vacuum sealed them. And I watched them making the meals and vacuum sealing them. And 
and then they freeze them, flash freeze them, and you can buy them, you can, you know, you can order them, and so on. But anyway, it was a nice company. It was started by a couple of Mechie graduates. I saw them up in the food incubator, and I think it's Fairfield, or Fairfax. But they're gone. They moved to New York. Same thing, mostly the energy cost, because that process was very energy intensive. So people do tend to pit the environmental against economic development, particularly here in Vermont. And they don't have the kind of rounded understanding that people like Bob Costanza and Herman Daly and many others have helped us to, to, to grasp of the economic value of other kinds of uh, resources. Uh, and it's a very narrow view and a very destructive view. But I guess, you know, my final point about this, you know, what the title of, of the talk indicates is that a sustainable, desirable future must be integrated across all of the realms of goods that we can think of and should find a way to finesse this issue of pitting goods against each other. Uh, and finally, it has to be inclusive. It has to be a vision for everybody. It has to be, in the end, a democratic vision that, that touches everybody's lives in a good way. So I guess one way we, that we could pose uh, the issue before us is what is the university's role in helping to create such a future? And I think the answers are fairly obvious. And again, it seems to me that almost any one of you as, as, as students and scholars and scientists and policymakers can give a better answer than I can give. But let me just, for purposes of thought for our discussion, uh, touch on some of the realms that I think uh, are encompassed for the university. The first and the very obvious one, and one that the university has been focused on for some time, uh, in large part through the leadership of, of faculty, staff, and students engaged in the UVM Environmental Council is to have uh, sustainable institutional practices, to really be a model for um, how we operate culturally, economically, uh, as an institution that exemplifies best sustainable practices. And I'd say uh, you can look at this across a broad, broad range of areas, how we manage energy, uh, how we how we create and manage waste, uh, how we limit it, how we focus our uh, consumption wherever we can on things that can be recycled and reused and be made part of a, uh, of a sustainable uh, economy, uh, what we do around transportation, uh, what we do. Uh, in all of our institutional practices. Now, I think we are, we have obviously are seen as a national leader in this area, but we're not doing anywhere nearly as well as we want to. Uh, that we're seen as a national leader, I think, is exemplified in the uh, study Cornell did last year, where uh, of sustainable core, sustainability officers, as it were, at uh, leading universities around the country singled out UVM as one of the five leading institutions of sustainable practices and where UVM was mentioned more times than any institution except Harvard when people asked to what institution, what, to what institutions do you look uh, for leadership in the environmental field. But we know from one of the really terrific projects uh, developed by the Environmental Council, our report card on ourselves, tracking UVM, that we uh, have a long way to go in many departments, that we've made some progress, but that uh, we are nowhere nearly where we want to be. And when we get engaged in our campus planning exercises, 
and we look at our campus, we can see in very glaring ways some of the areas in which we fall short. And we, are, we are just to thwart in this building the most ugly expanse of asphalt uh, in the city of Berlin. And it stretches all around the, the water tower and to the very verge of the Aiken building. Uh, it's, it's pretty awful. Uh, and of course, what that speaks is the dominance of the internal combustion engine, uh, our failure to do what we aim to do, but that we haven't done yet, which has become a largely pedestrian campus, uh, and to uh, move more and more toward alternative uh, ways of getting to the campus and around on the campus, uh, which of course you know, goes to all sorts of benchmarks that we want to achieve, such as reducing emissions. Uh, but it's not easy to do. I, I predict the spilling of a good deal of blood uh, when we really put it to ourselves as a community that we're not going to be able to drive up to our buildings. And in truth, it's harder here than it is on some pedestrian campuses. Uh, I, I had the pleasure for many years, and it helped to prepare me for the kind of urban planning, campus design work that we're doing on the campus master plan, to be on the Landscape Architecture Accreditation Board. And I, I'm not a landscape architect. I don't even play one on TV. But it was, it was terrific being on this board, because I got to visit lots of campuses and look at their their urban planning and their landscape architecture, and often their related programs, whether landscape was located, as it sometimes is in a horticulture department in, a, in an ag school, or whether it was located uh, as it was on the campuses that I visited in, in design schools, where you looked at the interaction with architecture and urban and regional planning and, and so on. But I, one of the campuses that I very much admired where I did their accreditation was the University of Arizona, which it did have a horrible transportation element in it. It had a, some of you have probably been there. It, was, it had this road, my memory of this, that it was eight lanes wide. Maybe it was only six, but it was called Speedway Drive. And it went right down one flank of the campus, and some of the buildings, including the Landscape Architecture Department were on the wrong side of Speedway Drive. But once you cross Speedway Drive, and you could do it uh, under the roadway uh, from some of the parking structures, where there were only bike paths and pedestrian paths to cross, you were in a pedestrian zone that was most of the main campus. And you know, there were some very obvious differences from our campus. Uh, Sure, there, were, there was access for emergency vehicles and for uh, people who were not mobile uh, on their feet. But other than that, uh, it was really a pedestrian campus. One thing that I've always noticed here is we don't have anything like the bike racks <laughs> around the buildings that they had at the University of Arizona. Well, I'd like us to get there. I just think it's going to be hard. I'd like all all or most of this asphalt to be green. <laughs> I'd like all of those awful parking lots around the water person building to be green. Uh, and I'd love to see, I'd, I'd love to see, you know, what we've envisioned in the master plan, a new academic quadrangle with lots of green space growing up adjacent to the historic campus green where those parking lots are. But uh, I hope you all, some of you, are prepared to protect us when we really start to push this vision. Because I know there's going to be a lot of pushback, don't you think so? And I think it's, it's easy for us to say we want to have a pedestrian campus, but it's going to be awfully hard uh, to implement it against the kind of resistance that I think we're going to have. Anyway, that's one area, institutional practices, and it goes to many different things. Certainly it goes to our efforts to uh, not only to develop uh, some alternative energy systems on the campus, uh, uh, I, 
think as we develop mass transit, we'll certainly want to move whenever we can, even beyond the, the biodiesel, to uh, what will emerge as more advanced and uh, more sustainable forms of, of, uh, of fueling vehicles. Uh, but it, it goes to a broad array of areas. So let's just leave that and, and move on to some others. Because I think there are the, uh, the curricular areas are very important. Um, and, the, and the research areas. Certainly we want our research and scholarship and our teaching uh, and the programmatic design of, of the university's educational offerings to reflect our commitment to a sustainable and desirable future. Uh, you know, broadly, we can characterize that and say that it needs to be because these, you know, now Henry James doesn't have a lot to teach me about uh, environmental or ecological issues. Uh, but Henry James says almost anything better than almost anyone else could say it. Uh, and he has a wonderful description of consciousness in which he says that consciousness is like a web. And when it's touched in one place, it trembles everywhere. And I think that's true of our world. It's true of the planet. It's true of our deepening understanding of ecological systems and social systems and political systems. Uh, and for that reason, because everything connects, and, you know, the, the, the battle cry of the literary modernism that really followed Henry James and largely drew on Henry James was E.M. Forster's cry, only connect. <laughs> uh, we want the scholarship, I think, and teaching and learning to be highly interdisciplinary, to be transdisciplinary. And that's going to have a lot of implications for how we think about research and teaching and learning, and also how we think about the ways in which the university is organized. You know, I'm, I am hoping at a meeting I've been invited to attend of the graduate faculty, I think sometime this spring, I don't know when, every day I go wherever they tell me to. I came here with, with only the notes that I wrote down 15 minutes before I walked over. Uh, but I'm hoping to throw some bombs at the graduate faculty meeting. And one, one bomb I'd like to throw that I don't expect really to have its intended effect, except maybe to get some people angry. I mean, I don't expect it to have its intended effect, alas, is to see if we couldn't free all or most of our graduate programs of the academic departments and even of the colleges and schools. I would love the graduate program fields to float free of the departments and to be highly transdisciplinary. Because I grew up in an institution at Cornell where the graduate program fields at least technically are not located in the departments. Any of them. The, the, uh, the graduate program field directors report to the deans of the, the dean of the graduate college. This is the case of many universities, but at Cornell it was particularly true, especially in, in, in some fields where it's very obvious that that needs to be the case. And in other fields it's not so obvious. I mean, it's hard to, to say that about Portuguese language and literature, right? But it's easy to say it about molecular genetics, because you can have molecular geneticists in many different colleges and schools and in many different departments. And some of them can be plant geneticists, and some of them can be animal geneticists. And if they're deep disciplinary scientists, and if you're interested in genetics, then if you're a graduate student, you want to study with, have access to all of that expertise. And you don't want to just be stuck in the biology department or the animal science department or the vet school. You want to be able to draw on all of those resources in an integrated way. And I think that's a, you know, I. I'm not proposing that we can take every graduate program out of its department, but I think we ought to move toward a model like that, and we won't exactly be inventing the wheel. I mean, a lot of schools like Cornell and Minnesota and UC Davis do this. 
UT Austin cut its graduate programs uh, free of the departmental uh, locations in the 80s. I've talked to Terry Sullivan, who was dean of their, their graduate school, a good deal about that. Uh, so I, I hope that uh, we can think about that. I expect resistance from deans and others. Uh, we had a lot of resistance, after all, to creating our new interdisciplinary neuroscience PhD. And it took a lot of hard work and a lot of sweat equity went into it. And it was just approved at the Board of uh, Trustees uh, on Friday. So it has yet to be fully implemented, but at least we have a blueprint down for a really interdisciplinary doctoral program. I think we have to think about really transdisciplinary research and teaching, but you know, my, my vision of this is that it really should unite teaching and research, and that it should really unite the work of the students, the faculty, and the professional staff. And moreover, that it should cut across undergraduate and graduate uh, education to create a real community of scholars that's uh, John Bramley and I are working on sort of what I call Vision 2. Uh, it came out of a retreat that Dean DeHayes and other, other deans were at in January, as well as uh, faculty and staff and graduate student leaders. It was in early January, and we unfortunately lost the undergraduate leadership. Uh, but we had all the vice presidents and deans and directors and, and so on. And, uh, John Bramley gave a wonderful talk, uh, made me want to be an animal science student if he ever returns to the department, uh, but he gave a wonderful talk about uh, the meaning of the land grant in the 21st century. Really a wonderful talk. And he talked about it in terms of revisioning UVM in relation to some very deep traditions here at the university that go back to James Marsh our fifth president, who in addition to being the inventor of the academic major and the elective system of courses that spread across the nation, also had a very strong commitment to the practical application of knowledge. It goes back to Vermont's Senator Justin Morrill, the author of the Land Grant Act, and it goes to perhaps our most distinguished graduate, John Dewey, uh, who was an apostle not only of progressive reform, but of experiential learning. And John suggested that people have really misunderstood the land-grant idea, and in fact, I think most of us know that almost nobody understands the land-grant idea. Some of us in land-grant universities think we do. Not everybody in the land-grant universities does, and few people outside of our campuses do, but you know, if you read the act carefully that Congress passed in the midst of the Civil War and that Abraham Lincoln signed and that led to Vermont accepting the land grant and then turning to Middlebury, which said, no, we don't want it, and Norwich, which said, no, we don't want it, and then UVM said, okay, we'll take the land grant. Uh, uh, if you read the act, it combines the idea of liberal education with the idea of educating the masses of the population. It's a very democratic idea in practical pursuits that benefit the community. And it does say, in addition to the liberal arts, which are mentioned in the Land Grant Act, it should include the agricultural and mechanical arts. But, but John's idea, and it's one that I thoroughly embrace and, and always have, is that the land-grant mission should suffuse the whole university. It should not only suffuse disciplines like those in the Rubenstein School around natural resources or the Ag School or the engineering school, because after all, most land grants are agricultural and mechanical colleges. 
sometimes people think it's just agriculture, but it's not. It's A and A. It's agricultural and mechanical, even in that narrow view. But clearly, the land grant idea should suffuse the whole university in all of its outreach efforts. Uh, in terms of practically applying knowledge that is validated by scholarship to solving real world problems. So what, what we have been thinking about is, we've been thinking about a lot of things, and I, I won't talk to you about all of them, but we've been really thinking about organizing uh, signatures of what it means to be educated at UVM around problem-based learning communities that bring together undergraduate students, graduate students, faculty, and staff to explore problems, to, ex to uh, expand knowledge, and to apply it to the solution of real-world problems. And I think this goes to sustainability. It goes to creating a desirable future. And certainly it goes to all of the disciplines that uh, you are engaged in and that have brought you here. Uh, You know, I think we would aspire for the university to be a model in both of these broad realms. That is, a model with respect to institutional practices and a model with respect to scholarship, teaching and learning, problem solving and, and the application of the fruits of our learning to creating a better world around us on every scale, on every scale, from the local scale uh, the challenges facing agriculture in the state of Vermont, the challenges facing us around issues like stormwater and the, uh, the quality of the lake and uh, polluted watersheds, to the much larger global problems that, that we face. And problems, of course, not only in, in uh, the natural environment, but in, in all of the other realms. Let, let, me, let me close these remarks and open the floor to questions by first talking about one of those local challenges. Uh, because I think you, you, if you haven't heard me talk about this, you may have seen the editorials in the Free Press or the Rutland Herald or elsewhere. I've actually been stumping the state of Vermont like, you know, somebody running for office for most of the last year talking about uh, what we see as a crisis in the state of Vermont. And that is uh, the demographic decline of the state. I think there, there, aren't any, there aren't any, there's no one here from the media, right? <laughs> the pardon? Might not admit it. <laughs> well then, for the sake of those in the media, if there are some hidden, I will say my remarks from this point forward are off the record. <laughs> If you can't respect that, you should leave. But I, I want to say a few things to you because this is in the family that I've been trying not to say in public because they're a little too scary. And I don't want to be too alarmist in public. But we are facing a demographic crisis in the state of Vermont, and it's compounded of the following elements. We have the lowest birth rate among the 50 states. We have the most rapidly aging population. We have the most rapid decline in our population of young people. You see schoolrooms emptying out in town after town around the state. We also have, pertinent to our work as post-secondary educators, uh, the biggest out-migration of college-bound high school graduates among the 50 states. A higher percentage of our high school graduates leave the state to go to college than those of any other state. And, you know, more than 80% of those are going to take their first jobs close to where they get their college degrees. Between 60 and 70% will never return here to Vermont during their working lives. Now, what this does to the population demographics over the next 30 years is pretty frightening. And I, this, is, this is one of the things that 
I'm trying not to say in public, but I'm going to say to you. Uh, I think our, our business, if you'll forgive the term, higher education of the state of Vermont is really in trouble. Really, really in trouble. When you think about this in the state of Vermont, it's a very important area of activity. Economically, in terms of economic activity, uh, the combination of our publicly supported and, and private colleges is the third largest economic sector of the state of Vermont. If you look, uh, I'll just tell you where I'm getting this data. If you look at the Western Interstate Commission for Higher Ed at their website, wichi.edu, W-I-C-H-E.edu, you, you can find a link in the bottom right-hand corner of the page to high school graduation projections. And it is uh, something they put out every three years. What they predict for Vermont, they do this for all 50 states, is that our high school graduates are going to go from just under 7,000 in 2001 to barely over 5,000 in 2017, 2018. Now just thinking about the higher ed sector, think about this. Only about 45% of those of our graduates now are going to four-year colleges. It's higher in some high schools, it's lower in others, but overall it's about 45% in the month. So if you have only 5,000 graduates a year, let's call it 50%. Let's say we get it up, so more kids are going to college. Only 2,500 graduates a year. Now, nearly 60% of those, it's 58% is our, is our nation-leading average, leave the state to go to college. If we don't change that, which is the point of the governor's proposal for Vermont Promise Scholarships, then 1,500 of those roughly go out of state. That leaves 1,000 Vermont college-bound high school graduates. Well, we're taking between six and 700 a year, right? And, and part of our plan, which we seem to be succeeding, is to attract more and more of those you know, most talented Vermont students to come to, to UVM and, and, to, and to have a bigger and bigger percentage of capable college-bound high school graduates choosing Vermont's university. What does that lead for the other schools? 350 or 400 a year for all of those other schools? They're going to crash. Certainly the Vermont State Colleges, which take most of their students, and are unbelievably important for the state and its well-being. Right? You don't have to spend half an hour in the Northeast Kingdom to know how important London State is for that part of the state. It would be utterly bereft without that institution. VTC in central Vermont, uh, Johnson, Castleton and their regions play similar roles. We saw Trinity College go under less than 10 years ago here in Burlington. There are a bunch of our private schools in Vermont, uh, including two in Burlington, that draw more than half of their student bodies from state residents. What's going to happen to them with that man? I think that's pretty scary, but it's just symptomatic. You know, what really happens, if you look at the U.S. Census Bureau website, uh, and they have on their home page a link called Projections. And you can look at population pyramids for what the Census Bureau thinks is going to happen in Vermont. Is that the state by 2030 is projected to grow by about 100,000 people. With an absolute decline over the year 2000 and the numbers of Vermonters under the age of 19. A very modest increase of about 4% in the Vermonters between the ages of 19 and 64. But virtually all of the growth, 100,000 people, the state will be 100,000 more people, virtually all of the growth will be people over 65. Some of them will keep working, many of them will contribute to their communities in very, very important ways. But overall, the dependency ratio, as economists call it, 
the ratio of the working age population to the dependent young and the dependent old will be disastrous. And whatever you care about, you care about sustainable agriculture, you care about rural communities, you care about health, you care about transportation, you care about pre-K through 12 or post-secondary, you care about health, you care about environmental protection, the state won't be able to afford any of those things, any of them, at the levels that it currently invests, even with massive tax increases on that working age population because of the change of, of the change of the proportions. So it seems to, to us that we have to do something about that. Try to. It won't be easy. And we have gone through A lot of thinking about what interventions there might be. And we've thought about how we can build the build a population demographic that isn't so uh, potentially catastrophic, not just for higher ed, but for the well-being of the state, socially and culturally, as well as economically. Uh, we've thought that the university has to play a leading role because there simply aren't regional economies that don't heavily depend upon the research institutions as sources of innovation and creativity and the uh, education of professionals for uh, 21st century jobs. So we thought about what that could be in Vermont. How can the state of Vermont find a viable niche in the national economy and the global economy? And how does that match up with the strengths of the university? And we've concluded what you, I think, heard us talking about or read about us talking about many of you, that this has to be around the creation of a very robust and innovative cluster of environmental technologies and businesses and enterprises that are among the global leaders. Why environmental? Why not health? We have a terrific medical school, after all, it ranked in the top 10 in the country in primary care last year in US News. The answer is simple. I, I don't think there's, as good as our medical school is, it ranks in the top 10 in primary care. It doesn't rank in the top 50 in research, even though there's a good density of quality in research in our medical school. The scale is too small. There's no way in which Vermont can be the global leader in pharmaceuticals or biomedical technologies or biomedical engineering with one tertiary care hospital and one small medical school. We simply don't have the ability to do this. We do think that if we define niche areas very carefully within uh, the broad realm of environmental enterprises that Vermont does have the capability to be a world leader. And that the university does, that with our enviable small size, as difficult as it is to build these integrated, interdisciplinary teaching and research programs, that we have a better chance of doing that if we put our minds to it together than huge universities with enormously uh, inert superstructures. So I'll, I'll stop there. I, I spoke longer than I meant to off my fragmentary notes. Uh, but I'm sure you, you, you don't have to ask me questions about that, about what I've talked about. Uh, you can ask about anything. Dean? So the, the, the picture of, of moving forward as you describe uh, interdisciplinary, and I, I would argue that's also and across operations and best practices, is is perhaps daunting as we just told earlier today. Um, would it be useful, would it be a, a reasonable administrative model to have, as we do for information in other areas, a chief environmental officer for the university, given the scale of how those integrations may take place? It might be. Uh, I don't know. I'll have to think about that. I've seen that proposal. Uh, 
but I haven't had a chance to think about it long and hard. Uh, I suppose uh, it would be fun to add a 22nd or 23rd vice president. It's about priorities. Um, it is about priorities. Uh, I don't. I don't know. That might be a good model. Um, Dean, it might be a good model, just as we spoke in a meeting that we were at together today about the importance of having a chief diversity officer. Um, we'll have to think about that. And again, I'll give you the same answer I gave earlier today. I want the new provost to be a partner in thinking about that. And I hope to have that person on board uh, sometime, you know, at least appointed. Uh, no later than mid-April and possibly much earlier than that, soon after the last candidate visits in March. So I think there's a lot of things that we can think about structurally. I also don't think that's necessarily a panacea to have a chief uh, environmental officer. And, you know, it, do you think about that in terms of operations or do you think about that in terms of uh, being a leader in the realm of thought around our teaching and research? Uh, I'm not sure, but I, 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 would, I would tend to favor the latter. You know, that we need, we need vision, we need somebody who can really help us to, to develop the, uh, the understanding and the scholarship and the, and the instructional programs that go with that. Uh, we know what the challenges are on the operational side. We do reasonably well in some areas and less well in others, but I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, that isn't a ball that collectively we don't have our eyes on pretty well. Uh, the, uh, you know, it's very difficult because it raises an issue that I know is dear to Dean DeHaze's heart, which is how do you get this done? And do you do it through centralized leadership or do you do it through distributed leadership? And I think the answer is, it has to be a blend of some kind with a good balance. And, you know, the biggest challenge around creating really interdisciplinary ways of thinking is you can't do that without grounding it in very strong disciplines. You, know, you can't build a strong chain with weak links. And so your disciplinary bases have to be very strong. And, and that means that, in some sense, despite what I said about pulling graduate program fields out of departments, you have to have strong disciplinary bases that in American institutions are based in cultural units called departments and colleges and schools. And uh, So do you create a strong central position, or do you try to engage all of the deans and their faculty and staff colleagues collaboratively and working together? I'm not sure what the right model should be, but I think it's a really good question to raise. Yeah? Um, well, I imagine that with the, your vision to make you, UVM an environmental university, that uh, collaborative efforts are important with uh, government. Yes. Both uh, the government locally and also I'm thinking of the upcoming congressional elections, and I was just wondering if you could comment uh, on this sort of uh, interactions and relationships that you have with government, both locally and federally, how those, those could change uh, with the upcoming election? Well, I don't want to predict anything that's ad hominem. Uh, with, I mean, you know, one, one, and this this isn't to dodge your question, of course. I mean, obviously, when you're when you're uh, a leader in a public institution. You can never take partisan positions. Even if you feel them inwardly, your job is to maximize the social and political capital of the institution and to work with whomever is in office. Uh, we're very pleased that Governor Douglas has promoted the idea of the Vermont Promise Scholarships and, and that he's embraced the vision of Vermont as a global leader in environmental enterprises, uh, both of which he talked about in the State of the State Address. Uh, we've had tremendous support from our federal delegation in creating things like the uh, Vermont Center for Emerging Technologies, where we are incubating environmental businesses. I think on March 6th, we'll be doing 
a press conference where uh, Chris Dudden, the CEO of Green Mountain Power, and, and I will both uh, be speaking uh, about the licensing of the technology uh, out of VSET, the Vermont Center for Environmental Technologies, uh, from a company called Electrocell that is using not a UVM technology, to be sure. So this is an example of our transfer. where they're, they're using an Israeli technology to uh, use electrical currents to remediate uh, agricultural soils that have been polluted. And Green Mountain Power is buying this from Electrocell, and that's what they'll be announcing on March 6th. So don't tell anyone. So they, we don't want it. And, uh, and they're going to be deploying this technology in the state of Vermont as a demonstration and as a public service. I think that's a good thing, but that came about in large part because we had wonderful support from Senator Leahy in getting these set going. We've had wonderful support uh, from Senator Leahy in getting uh, the Vermont Advanced Computer Center, Computing Center funded, and that's going to help us a lot in working on uh, complex systems integration and modeling that are going to serve our environmental agendas and other research agendas. Uh, Senator Jeffords helped to bring us uh, the National University Transportation Center, and believe me, they are really tickled in Washington at the Department of Transportation that it's not going to be another center about asphalt. It's going to be themed around advanced sustainable technologies for northern communities, and we're going to try to uh, really leverage the resource that comes with that to uh, advance this vision both of the university and of its role in the development of the state. Uh, I think, you know, I don't know how long you've been in Vermont. I've only been here four years. I'll start my fifth year on July 1. And, uh, but I have never been in a place, I will say this broadly, and I think it's a fair nonpartisan statement, well, with a higher level of civility in the political system. Uh, even when you have a, a debate between uh, people between whom there are real partisan bones of contention, the, uh, the discourse is a, a high level of uh, not only civility but rationality about it. Uh, that doesn't mean there isn't that that picture isn't perturbed by flashes of idiocy and irrationality. We wouldn't be human if that weren't the case. But, but it's, it's pretty good as a political polity. I think on the other hand, we have some things working against us in the state, especially uh, excessive localism that make global solutions to problems very daunting, whether it's the issue of having, and we'll never get into this, right? 65 or 64, whatever it is, school systems in a state that has the population of a mid-sized city school district. Uh, there are a lot of inefficiencies, and there, you know, I'm sure that Chris Cornell wouldn't have had a binder this thick of applications to build a distribution center if we've been able to solve the localism and the turfishness that, you know, there must have been 50 different applications in there, probably all with good purposes and environmental protection and, 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 and careful development that ask the same questions about the company. It could have been merged into a single electronic form and made it easier both to file the forms and to protect the environment. <laughs> but that kind of localism is probably worse in Vermont than in, in most places, balancing the civility. Yeah? yeah I'm struck by your comment about UVM being a model. And I'm, I'm guessing we probably won't be able to change how the state does its regulations necessarily. But I am struck by the possibility of UVMs being a model for the nation as to how a campus might act sustainably. I mean, I, th I think we have a lot of the pieces in place, but I'd really encourage us to think about, I mean, we're small enough that it might actually work here, where UVM would be the model of how to run a campus sustainably that other, other parts of the nation would look to. Well, I hope we get there. You know, I think we've taken, so, you know, the, the Environmental Council has helped us to take steps over the year and to raise consciousness, and some of this is about consciousness raising. We've taken 
uh, institutional steps in recent years through things like the, the green building policy that says every building and every major renovation will at a minimum seek LEED certification. Uh, and we have constraints and challenges too. And, and of course one of them is around the cost of, of certain kinds of choices that we might want to make. Uh, balancing them with all the other resource demands that we also very much want to satisfy. But yes, I agree. That's one of the areas in which we should strive to be a model and a national leader. And, and insofar as we are seen as one already, which apparently is the case, I think we have to be humbled by that because we know we don't live up to it as well as we would like to. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I just wanted to maybe play devil's advocate here a little bit and sure. say that one of the challenges that might come with advertising ourselves as an environmental university is that we attract a lot of environmental students, and that takes away from the interdisciplinariness of the student body. And I think that we would run into the possibility of creating an environmental bubble of students that haven't, haven't been exposed to these other ideas. And I think that that's something we should keep in mind as we go forward. I think sustainability isn't only about the environment and also includes the knowledge of a lot of other things. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more that, it, that, that we don't want to lose the roundness and comprehensiveness of the university. Uh, on the other hand, while very large numbers of our students and other members of the academic community are very committed to an environmental and sustainable vision of the institution and of the world, we don't have all that many environmental students, to be honest, at least not in the Rubenstein School. How many baccalaureate degrees were we planning to give this year? Well, we have about 500 undergraduate students. I know, but, but we'll give about 120 or so. 120? So it's, you know, about 5% of the graduates uh, will we'll award over 2,200 degrees uh, in May. It's not. It's not as though there aren't majors in every field, and, and some are growing on the undergraduate level at least much faster than, than in the majors in uh, the Rubenstein School. Judy. Judy Branch with the extension. I want to thank you for your comments about the Land Grant University. And um, as we've talked before, I think we're a small enough state that um, we could also be a model for um, extension in, uh, in the state as well. I was interested in your comment about um, organizing signatures. Um, about what it means to be educated at UVM. And I'm also wondering um, if you um, see a possibility of this philosophy of physics um, that um, Dana Zohar talks about in rewiring the corporate brain, um, how that might help with leadership. Well, I, I haven't read that book, so I can't tell you. Uh, my, my but I'm perfectly happy to have my brain rewired <laughs> through this kind of dialogue. There was someone else up here. Yes? Um, you had touched before on Al's comments about um, the economic yeah. side. I mean, the environmental university, you talked about the economy of resources and the zero mass in the future, and the difficulties of achieving any sort of environmental and economic you know, balance. How do you see the university taking that forward? And how do you well, actually, I think what, what we've done is diabolically clever. We, you know, we've sort of come into this debate and said, well, not only do economic development and environmentalism not have to be pitted against each other, but the future vitality and prosperity of the state can be based on developing environmental enterprises. And I think that you know, actually strikes a chord with a lot of people because it's really not about uh, heavy manufacturing. You know, and the vision of this that I have extends across a broad range of economic activities, so sustainable agriculture, organic agriculture, value-added agricultural production. It extends across financial services. It's, it's firms like Native Energy uh, trading 
emissions credits. Um, it's firms like, you know, if it's, if it's manufacturing, it's, it's, it's on the level of an NRG, uh, that it's very light manufacturing. It's really about innovation and design and ideas. And I think yet we're talking about uh, jobs predominantly for professionals that attract uh, talented, highly educated people who are idealistic, who want to do good things uh, to help create a sustainable and desirable future, and who uh, will be very committed to values that are really core Vermont values. So I think that's the way you thread that needle. I also think, I have, actually, I, I'm probably naive, but you know, sometimes it's good to be naive and say, let's, let's just try this, even though people say you can't do it. So I do imagine that maybe Vermont could get to the point where a lot of those local jurisdictions and jurisdictions within different agencies say, yeah, we could create a, a common electronic form. Uh, why not? There's a great case study I did once out of the Harvard Business School. Uh, I was a student doing the case study, but it was, a, it was something called Singapore Trade Net. And, you know, it was very complicated because the port of Singapore wanted to get an advantage over competing ports in like Hong Kong and Shanghai. And it was taking a week to offload a cargo in the port because there was so much red tape to go through with multiple bureaucracies. And they were all very entrenched and turf protected. And people in Singapore did a huge amount of political work to get everybody to agree to a single electronic form that could be filed from sea in 10 minutes. And it gave them a huge competitive advantage. And it, it didn't change at all what each of those agencies was doing. We'll take, make this one the last question. Yes, sir. Um, speaking of trying to make Vermont more sustainable economically, um, why aren't you paying uh, a lot of workers at the school a livable wage, um, being that that would make them able to live and prosper in our communities? Um, obviously, well, as being an environmental student, I understand the social aspects of providing fair wages to why isn't this an issue um, at our administrative level? Well, I, actually, I don't know what's, I, I, I don't know that the assumption underlying your question is true that we don't pay a lot of people a livable wage. Well, there are many different definitions of livable wage. We've been working closely with a uh, committee of the Student Government Association looking at uh, a concept called basic needs budgets to try to uh, get at a better understanding of this. We certainly want to support all of our faculty and staff competitively. Uh, we're very pleased with what has happened with faculty over the last few years. Uh, the uh, Cumulatively, the first two contracts with the faculty collective bargaining unit, I don't think there's any question that they're going to take the faculty from close to the rock bottom among public doctoral institutions to the median, or very close to the median. We actually thought it would take them above it, uh, but that depends upon an assumption that raises at peers will only be three and a half percent a year over the next uh, couple of years. Uh, but we've moved that very fast. Uh, we're very progressive in our employment practices. We're the only university that I know of, and if you can find another, I'd love to cite them too and brag about them that indexes employee contributions to health insurance to income, that indexes the cost of parking permits to income. When we look at things like the, uh, the uh, Vermont, the Burlington standard for calculating livable wages, we're not sure, but we think there could be a, several dozen employees who might fall below that. But we're not sure that we understand it fully. And we're also not sure that that's a good standard. Uh, Burlington does it in a very odd way. Uh, they count everybody as single and childless, and then say we're paying everyone a livable wage. Well, 
Uh, you know, and I think there's there's a there's a question about about these methodologies. The State Department of Labor has a very different methodology uh, that says a livable wage is very very different for a single person without children than for uh, a married person with three children. Well, that's probably true, but on the other hand, I don't think most of us want to be uh, engaged in a system where we say, well, here's an assistant professor with a wife and four children. He should be paid more than this new assistant professor who's a single woman. I mean, so it's very, very difficult to get at this stuff. We take it very seriously. And uh, I don't know if it's gone out yet, but I, I drafted a letter to the staff which says that we're going to be engaged in some very serious market analysis of where staff salaries stand in relation to both uh, local uh, markets, peer institutions in New England, and where appropriate national labor markets, and engage the staff uh, through the staff council in helping us to understand those and to addressing any problems that emerge in that. But I, I simply, I, I think it's a, it's a good concern for you to raise, but I don't think it's true that we have large numbers of people who are, who are not paid uh, competitively. Thank you very much, President Fogart.